Choosing the right cost effectiveness model or CEM is not always easy, given that there are multiple approaches out there that you can use to calculate ISAs and net monetary benefit. I'm a health economist with over eight years of practical experience working in the pharmaceutical industry, during which I've built countless models myself, constantly having to figure out the best tool to get the job done. That's why in today's video, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the most common analytical frameworks you can use to derive cost effectiveness estimates, helping you to decide which approach is the right one for you. I'll be doing this in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to run through eight different types of CEMs, which include Markov models, petition survival models, decision trees, and more. This will give you a basic understanding of how these models work. In the second part, I'll propose a set of five questions that you can answer for yourself, which will guide you in selecting the best CM type for your decision problem. Let's start by looking at one of the most popular model types called the Petition Survival Model or PSM for short. This type of CM is so popular due to its simplicity, which results from the fact that you can use survival curves directly to determine health state membership, making it an ideal candidate to model cancer treatments. As you can see from this example of a cancer treatment, a partition survival model allows you to use the overall and progression-free survival curves from the pivotal clinical trial to follow a theoretical cohort of patients through time as they move between a set of exhaustive and mutually exclusive health states. In our case, this results in three distinct health states or buckets, whereby patients can either be progression-free, progressed or dead. As every patient must be in one of these health states, the proportions of patients in all health states at any given time point should always add up to 100%. As we know, the proportion of patients who are still alive from the area under the curve or AUC of our OS curve, we can determine how many patients have died at any given time by subtracting the percentage of patients alive from the OS curve from 100%. Similarly, we can subtract the PFS from the OS curve to quantify the proportion of patients in the progressed health state. Lastly, we know how many patients are progression-free through our PFS curve. This is why a PSM allows you to easily visually compare the effectiveness of two treatments by directly plotting the survival curves and using the area under the curve to gauge total survival and progression-free time. This this provides a clear visual representation of which treatment performs better. Another frequently used analytical framework for decision making is the Markov model, which is probably the most common type of all of the CEMs. To stick with our cancer example from earlier, a Markov model allows us to use the same three distinct health states we've used in our PSM, only that this time the number of people in any point in time is dictated by transition probabilities rather than using the area under the curve. These transition probabilities are visualized using arrows between health states whereby the round arrows represent the probability of remaining in the same health state. As a patient's condition changes over time, they move or transition between health states while Time is reflected via discrete time periods called cycles that are usually set to a certain number of weeks or months depending on the natural history of the disease, treatment intervals and data availability. In a Markov model, the time spent in a health state is associated with specific utility and cost, both of which are aggregated for a modeled cohort of patients over successive cycles to summarize the cohort experience. For example, patients in the progressed health state will typically have lower utility and higher costs than those patients in the progression-free health state as their health worsens and hospitalization becomes more likely. I've used cancer to illustrate how Markov models work, but they can also be adapted to represent all possible 
consequences of an intervention of interest, covering more than just three health states, making it easier to model the natural history of a more complex medical condition. While Markov models use abstract concepts, decision trees are more intuitive to understand. They are so intuitive because they reflect all pathways a patient can take, which makes them very realistic, as the patient's decision is incorporated as a central element of the model design. Take this example of a simple decision tree, which can considers the decision of receiving a treatment or no treatment. As you can see, decision trees usually use squares to visualize a so-called choice node and circles to represent a chance node. While patients can decide whether to have the treatment, what happens to them afterwards is out of their control and therefore affected by chance. A key characteristic of decision trees is that probabilities at any specific node must always add up to one, as you can see here. Cost and outcomes are assigned to each segment of each branch of the decision tree, including the end of each branch or terminal node which is also referred to as the leaf. These terminal or end nodes are commonly visualized using a triangle. Using this information, we can calculate the mean value of treatment and no treatment, allowing us to conclude that in our simple example, having the treatment is associated with a higher net benefit. As the name of our next CM type suggests, cure fraction or mixture cure models can be considered for therapies that may offer a cure to a proportion of patients. Given that standard parametric survival models are predicated on the idea that at some point in time, all patients will experience the event, be it disease progression or death, such models might not adequately capture the benefits of a potentially curative intervention. The challenge with this approach is how we can quantify the cure fraction, which states how many patients are cured and how many patients are still at risk of disease progression. A cure fraction model approach may be justified in cases where there is a clear plateau in the survival data, which allows to separate the relative survival curve for an uncured group of patients from the whole sample as shown in this graph. Crucially, patients who are cured are obviously still at risk of dying due to other causes, which need to be accounted for via background mortality. Adapting a cure fraction approach will significantly improve the ISA compared to scenarios in which the cure fraction is ignored, which is why careful consideration should be given to the cure assumption, given that results might be biased by immature data. Next up, we're moving on to the patient level simulation models, or PLS models. These are fundamentally different from the models we've covered so far, given that Markov, PSM, decision trees and cure fraction models are usually all set up as cohort models. There's a DSU document available for these type of models, which I will link to in the video description. And they also provide a concise summary of PLS models which I'll blend in for you on screen. Essentially, a PLS model will estimate outcomes for model patients one at a time based on a random selection of patients, which allows the recording of individual patient histories. Once enough individual patients are modeled, mean outcomes can then be estimated for the entire population. Generally speaking, you may consider a PLS model when you've got high heterogeneity in the patient population, meaning that there is significant variability among patients that could impact outcomes and costs. In practice, however, these PLS models aren't used as often as compared to the other types we've discussed so far. Venturing more deeply into the obscure and less frequently applied CM types, distributional cost effectiveness analysis or DCEA can be considered when you want to incorporate health inequality concerns into the economic evaluation. The DCEA can provide distributional breakdowns of who gains most and who bears the largest burdens by equity relevant social variables such as socioeconomic status, ethnicity or geographical location. In this context, researchers have introduced the equity impact plane as a tool that allows the consideration of trade-offs between 
improving total health, which is the aim that underpins conventional cost effectiveness modeling and equity objectives, for example, by prioritizing severely ill patients. Ideally, we want interventions to be in the top right corner of the equity impact plane so that they're cost effective and improve equity. Moving on to our next analytical framework, we need to talk about dynamic transmission models. These dynamic models can reproduce the direct and indirect effects that may arise from a communicable disease control program. As stated in this paper from Pittman et al, the probability of a susceptible individual becoming infected at any one point in time, also known as the force of infection, is related to the number of infectious individuals in the population. This probability will change over time and will feed back into the future force of infection. This means that if an intervention reduces the pool of infectiousness, then the risk to uninfected susceptible individuals will decrease. That is, individuals not reached by the program can still benefit from experiencing a lower infection risk. Imagine a classroom with 30 students. At first, only one student has a cold. If no one else is sick, the chance of other students catching the cold is low because only one person can spread it. But as time goes on, more students might get infected. And as more students get sick, the chance of others catching the cold increases because now there are several people spreading it. If a lot of students become infected, it becomes easier for the rest of the class to catch the cold. And the more sick students there are, the higher the chance that others will get infected. And this pattern continues to grow until the number of sick students starts to shrink again. So in summary, if you're trying to model a communicable disease, consider using a dynamic transmission model. Last on my list of CMs for today are so-called treatment sequence models. This type of model is needed for disease areas in which multiple treatments are available, expanding the usual decision problem of comparing two discrete treatments against one another to compare a treatment sequence instead. If, for example, there are three treatments available to treat a patient, let's call them A, B and C, you might want to compare if the order in which the patient receives these treatments impacts their outcomes. A patient may receive treatment A first, followed by treatment C, and lastly treatment B. So our treatment sequence is A, C, B in this case. But is that better than if the patient would have started with treatment C, followed by A and then B? You can only answer this question if you compare the sequences against each other, so ACB versus CAB. Now that we have discussed the different types of cost effectiveness models, you might already have a better idea of which type of model is right for you. In case you still can't decide, here are my five questions to help you figure out which type of model to choose. The first question you can ask yourself is what your research aim is. Is your aim to evaluate a single intervention or multiple interventions? If you're assessing multiple interventions, does the sequence of those interventions matter? If the sequence matters, consider a treatment sequence model. Is your research aimed at addressing issues such as inequality, such as socioeconomic factors, ethnicity or deprivation? In that case, a distributional cost effectiveness model would be best for you. Also, ask yourself which disease you're trying to model. If you're trying to model a cancer treatment, you probably want to use either a partition survival model or a Markov model. The PSM approach is simpler than the Markov model, but it is also limited in what it can do. If you're modeling a chronic condition, your go-to framework should be the Markov model, as it allows you to model complex, reoccurring health states that reflect the natural history of a disease. If you want to model an acute condition instead, a simple decision tree model might be all you need. This is because acute conditions often have clear short-term decisions with finite outcomes. A surgical intervention, for example, may either be successful or result in complications. When you're working in a disease area where your intervention affects disease transmission, you should build that into your model by using a dynamic transmission model approach. If there's reason to believe that the treatment you're trying to model is curative for some patients, you should 
evaluate if a cure fraction model is appropriate. Related to which disease you're trying to model, you also want to consider if the disease affects patients differently. Should this be the case, and you're trying to model a highly heterogeneous patient population, a patient level simulation model might be necessary. Which model is feasible for you to build may also be dedicated by the data that you've got access to. If you want to build a PSM, for example, do you have access to the survival curves that you need to populate the model? Similarly, if you're planning on building a Markov model, how are you planning to inform the transition probability? As health economic modelers, we often need to make compromises and lack of data is one such aspect that's frequently forcing us to make such concessions. As with most things in life, simplicity is usually better than complexity, even though complexity is still sometimes necessary. Ask yourself what the simplest modeling approach is you can use to address your decision problem. Do you really need to build a patient level simulation model or is a Markov model maybe good enough? Always try to build the simplest model possible while adding as much complexity as necessary. Complexity will affect how well your results get understood by any external audience and simplicity enhances the transparency and should therefore be at the top of your mind when choosing your model framework for your next cost effectiveness analysis. Last, think about the time horizon of your analysis. Are you trying to model a short-term time horizon of maybe a few weeks or months? Or are you more interested in long-term outcomes which only become visible with a time horizon of several years or even a lifetime? Luckily, all approaches I've mentioned today, except for the decision tree approach, are well suited to model long-term effects. On the contrary though, short-term effects are most effectively communicated via more simple decision tree models. Now that you're done watching this video, check out one of my other videos that I'll blend in for you on screen. Maybe you're interested in learning about how the nice technology appraisal process works, in which case you should watch this video right here next. As always, thanks so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one.